fitness, setting goals, essence, oh, um, behavioral and lifestyle change, and stress and anxiety. So integrative medicine, according to Craig, yeah, um, it's often the best way to treat a patient. So you acknowledge that there's conventional medicine, but there's also an integrative approach. Um, do you guys know what CAMs are? Please nod. I don't care if you actually know. Um, so some CAMs can be safer and more cost effective than conventional treatments. As you can imagine, buying antibiotics can be expensive, but you buy like omega-3 and it's cheap. And that's more cost effective. Um, some stats that they like to throw in there for the multiple choice questions is 60 to 65% of Australians use some form of CAM. Um, and 89% of use CAMs for serial, serious medical conditions. And 72%, this actually came up on our exam, so 72% of them did not tell their doctors. So just remember those, those numbers. So CAMs, they are therapies used alongside conventional treatments. They're not replacement therapies. They're used with conventional treatments. It's not alternative medicine, um, which is therapies used as an alternative. So CAMs are additional, not alternative. Um, they're usually popular amongst those types of people, so people who look for a holistic approach, people with specific cultural beliefs, apparently people who are more educated, and people who have poorer health. So there are pros and cons of CAMs, obviously. Pros is a lot of the time they can be safer because they're more natural. Um, they can be more cost effective because they're found everywhere. Um, some patients, bye. <laughs> feel, like, feel. Um, <laughs> Some patients prefer more natural treatments rather than more chemicals. Um, people are dissatisfied with conventional treatments because often they don't work and they have a lot of adverse effects. Next point, there's adverse effects from conventional treatments. Um, people want a holistic approach. They want best of both worlds sort of thing. And patients often feel like their doctors are actually including them in their treatment options by saying that they can have um, alternatives as well and additional supplements. Types. There's like one question on this ever. Um, you got whole medicine systems. You're not even listening to me now. Um, whole medicine systems, biologically based. You got mind body, which is all about mindfulness. Energy medicine, which is basically yoga and acupuncture. And then you've got manipulative medicine. So things like massage, chiropractor, acupuncture, mindfulness. So what does practicing mindfulness actually involve? Most of the time it's just sitting in a room listening to someone talk to you. Um, but actually, it involves an open, curious, accepting, self-compassionate attitude, and you need to regulate your attention. So you need to know where your attention is and prioritize it on specific things. So you need to focus on one thing and do it well, basically. Um, so you've got formal and informal um, mindfulness. You've got meditation, that's formal, because you're actually sitting down and doing something. Daily activities, so just being mindful when you're doing daily activities, that's an informal way. And then you've got accepting and letting go. That's just a, like a mindful state of mind. So it's cognitive practice. Benefits of mindfulness. So it allows you to achieve peak performance. It um, apparently slows aging and shortens your telomeres, according to Craig's book, which he prescribes as further reading. Oh, God. Um, you get people who practice mindfulness have lower levels of neuroticism, dissociation, and psychological symptoms. You have higher emotional intelligence if you practice mindfulness. Um, you get less relapses in patients who practice mindfulness for conditions like depression. Um, and you get, for conditions like cancer, and overall less stress, which, as you can see, is beneficial. Um, for the patient, it lowers the severity of the illness so it's not impacting as much on their life. And for the clinician, if you're being mindful, you're more aware of everything that you're doing, so you're less likely to make errors in diagnosis and things like that. Essence. If you don't know what essence stands for by now, I can't help you. <laughs> you just need to know what it stands for. Um, we'll go through it quickly. So education is not like education here, it's about health education. So it's the level of patient understanding and knowledge of their medical life, basically. So what their condition is, how much they know about it, how, to, how much they know about taking care of themselves, that sort of thing. Um, 
In terms of general education, so like school education, it can be important because if someone's less educated in school, then you might need to alter your communication. Um, and it can also indicate access to resources, which is an indicator of access to healthcare. Stress, so you've got stress and anxiety. They are different things. They feel the same, but they're different. Anxiety is being worried about a future event, which is disproportional to the level of threat. So, yeah. Um, stress is a perceived inability to cope. So it's got to, stress has to do with how you're feeling and the resources that you have available to deal with how you're feeling. So if you don't have enough resources to deal with the stress of coping with an exam, you will feel stressed. So you've got an exam coming up. If you have all the resources you need to face that exam, you will not feel stressed, which is no one. Um, if you have an exam coming up and you don't think you have enough resources to face it, you will feel stressed, which is most people. So the effects of stress, hope stress basically is bad for your body. So if you have chronic stress, it can lead to decreased immune function, tiredness, headaches, depression, nausea. You can feel aggressive and agitated a lot. You feel it hard to concentrate. You can, it, can, it is a risk factor for a lot of diseases and conditions. It can just make it worse. And you have a prolonged activation of your sympathetic nervous system. Allostatic load. It's basically wear and tear of the body due to stress because you have activated your sympathetic nervous system for a really, really long time. Um, hopefully you know this by now, but the SNS is your fight or flight response. And so stress and anxiety are an important part of survival. Um, and it can, so if you have an increased allostatic load, it can lead to chronic depression and anxiety. And eventually you get things like immune dysregulation, atherosclerosis, which you guys haven't covered yet, but it's basically heart disease. Um, you get bone deterioration and you can get atrophy of your brain neurons, basically. Burnout. I have a cat, so you'll see a lot of cat photos. Um, so signs of burnout, they love to do burnout, and I especially think they're gonna put it up more this year because the WHO just acknowledged burnout as official disease. Um, so signs of burnout, you've got four main ones. Burnout is one of the signs of burnout. You, they will actually put that on the exam. Burnout is one of the signs of burnout. Um, lack of personal achievement, emotional exhaustion, and depersonalization. So statistics to remember, because they're all related to medical students. 28% um, of medical students reported to suffer from burnout by their final year. And 75% of interns had burnout after eight months. So remember those stats, because they, again, they love to use stats for multiple choice. Stress management. So the benefits of actually managing your stress means that you can improve your immune function, you can reduce anxiety, distress, depression, which can occur from stress. You can improve your sensitivity towards others so you won't get angry and agitated. Um, you're using positive coping skills, which is good. You have better resolution of professional conflicts because you're not feeling that agitation and aggression as much. You've got increased empathy and you no longer feel isolated. So those are good. So that's why you should use stress management. Spirituality. So spirituality is not just religion. It relates to how any person finds meaning in their life. And it's important to consider because it can inf influence someone's decision making on whether or not to undergo treatment. It can impact their overall health. Um, it can also impact their coping strategies. So what strategies they will use for what particular reasons. Again, it'll influence treatment. So whether or not they choose to undergo that treatment. And a sense of spirituality can actually be protective against things like depression, suicide, substance abuse, and illness. So it can be a pr protecting factor rather than a risk factor. And fun fact, 83% of patients actually want their doctors to ask about their spiritual beliefs. So when you're going through a history taking and you're going through essence and you think, why the hell am I asking about spirituality? Because of this. So you've got two views on happiness. You've got hedonic, which is immediate gratification, or you've got eudonic, which focuses on events like progressive meaning and per progressive personal growth. That's not really all that important. Exercise. So obviously there's benefits to exercise. It delays the onset of diabetes. It slows the degra de degradation of telomeres, which means that it slows aging. 
Um, it also reduces mortality. Um, statistics show that males exercise more than females and that exercise levels decline dramatically once you get over 18 and it's lowest at 45 to 54 years old. Um, the people most likely to be inactive are women, um, non-English speaking people, people with a lower edu education level and social economic status and people who have children. 70% um, of Australians over 15 are classified as sedentary. So that's another statistic to remember. Um, these are the guidelines, according to Craig, that are the best ways for exercise. And it's seven, it's, so it's basically moderate exercise. It's not oh, high. Um, it's moderate exercise, so it's not high intensity exercise, which is something to remember because a lot of the time they'll put that up there. So it's not high intensity, it's moderate three to seven times per week, 30 to 45 minutes per day. People don't exercise and they give reasons because they have lack of time, lack of motivation, lack of money, they have physical injuries or conditions, or it's just inconvenient to exercise. Nutrition. So the guidelines for nutrition are not the pizza, the other one. Um, so whole fresh food, it's usually mainly plant-based, so less of red meats. Um, it's a varied diet well-prepared, no or little empty calories, one and a half to two litres of water and less than 30% of your total intake should be fat. And just, they like to use this, it's not really actually helpful in real life, but the Ornish diet, which is a low fat vegetarian diet accompanied with moderate levels of exercise can help prevent cancer. Again, according to Craig's book. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's mean. Um, no, it's fine. I'll just talk louder. Um, so nutrition and telomeres. Basically, you get longer telomeres with those things and shorter telomeres with the other things. So vitamin D, C, E, folate, omega-3, good for you. They will make you live longer. The other things will make you live shorter. Connectedness. So there's a difference between isolation and solitude. So isolation is a lack of connectedness. So feeling excluded and solitude is being physically alone, but you don't have the other characteristics of isolation. So you're physically alone, but you're still, you still feel connected. So you just choose to be alone. Um, it can come from, so connectedness can come from many different things. It can come from professionals like psychiatrists and things like that, or it can come from internet, groups, clubs, family, friends, community, peers, wherever. And there are protective factors for connectedness. So a happy marriage, obviously if you're in an unhappy marriage, that doesn't protect you. Um, contact with family, having a religious affiliation or being the member of a group, any group. Environment, so you've got three aspects of the environment, physical, man-made and non-physical. So you've got direct impacts on your health for environment would be things like air quality, chemical exposure, soil quality and the climate. Indirect impacts on your health would be mental, mental health environment, community environment, and living conditions. So they will still impact it, but not directly. Ornish program again. So you've got group support, stress management, low vegetarian diet, moderate exercise, and no smoking. So this is a program that they love to bring up in questions, especially Craig, he reuses his questions, so this will probably come up. Um, it, the Ornish program, if implemented correctly, Minimize or minimizes or prevents um, cardiovascular disease. It can slow or stop the progression of early stage cancers and it can increase telomere length, so therefore extend your life. I'm not gonna go through this. Please just memorize this. It's used so much. If you don't know it, good luck. Um, <laughs> it's actually really useful. Adept. So you've got a couple of things to set goals but this is the only one that is really to change a habit. So ADEPT, you've got awareness of your habit, your bad habit, your decision to change your habit, the effort you put into changing the habit, the persistence to continue changing the habit, and the tolerance of any discomfort that you might face when you're changing that habit. If you do all of those things, according to Craig, you will overcome any bad habit. You've got goal settings, you've got two, SMART, which is pretty straightforward. You need to set a specific goal that's measurable. It needs to be attractive. It needs to be realistic and you need to be able to achieve it in a timely manner. 
Basque is more thinking about how people set goals and what goals they set. So behaviour, so what people do. Attitude, how people think and what they think. So the skills, so you're not going to set a goal if someone doesn't have the skills to achieve that goal. And knowledge, you need to give people the knowledge in order to achieve their goals. That was HEP. It's done. It's over. Take a deep breath. It's okay. Okay. Please don't clap. We're not done. <laughs> um, okay. HKS, this stuff is sort of, it's actually much more relevant than HEP. Did you guys have my three? Okay, cool. I was worried that you didn't. I was like, you're going to wonder who this random man I put on the slides is. <laughs> I'm glad you do. Okay. Um, he's amazing. Anyway, so we're going to cover some basics of the healthcare system, health determinants, Indigenous health, primary healthcare, access to healthcare, and just like five seconds on refugee and asylum seeker health. Okay, so according to the WHO, the definition of health is a complete physical, mental, and social well-being state. So it's not the absence of disease. So you can't say that someone's healthy if they simply don't have disease. They must also have a be in a state of complete physical and mental social well-being. So therefore, it excludes people with a chronic illness. They might be healthy, they just might have a chronic illness. Um, and complete is basically Im impossible to attain and it's really hard to measure. So this definition is deeply flawed, but it's still being used. So primary healthcare, the mnemonic is PIMPFEST. Um, primary healthcare is, should be available to all, it's easy to access, and it focuses more on self-reliance and self-determination of the patient, and it's all about social development, really, rather than actual practical medicine. So PIMPFEST is provision of essential drugs, um, immunizations, maternal and child health care, prevention of endemic diseases, food and nutrition, education about health, supply of clean water and sanitation, and treatment of common diseases. So you've got types of health care. You've got primary and secondary. Primary is basically like your GPs, first point of contact, no referral needed. Secondary care, you need a referral, something like surgeons, specialists, things like that. Social determinants of health. I'm sure you've heard so much about this, so I'm going to go quickly. Um, social determinants can be positive or negative. They can be modifiable or non-modifiable. They will ask you questions about modifiable and non-modifiable, so know which ones are which. They can be, they can have a direct change in health, they can be material factors, or they can be indirect influences. So you've got things like income, education, social support, employment, culture, geographic location, and all those other ones. So obviously things like social determinants of health like gender, that's non-modifiable. Well, questionably, but non-modifiable in the eyes of med. Um, but you've got things like geographic location. That is modifiable. You can change where you live, sort of. Equality versus equity. This is something that you need to understand. Equality is where you give the same treatment for everyone regardless of need. Equity is where you aim to achieve equal outcomes through positive discrimination. So you give treatment based on need. So if someone needs more treatment, you give it to them. You don't give them the same amount of treatment and let them stay sort of sick, like that little person who can't see over the fence. You don't give everyone the same thing. You give it based on need to achieve the same outcome. So access to healthcare, you've got, you have to consider availability if something exists, accessibility if someone can use it and access it. You've got horizontal equity, which is the equal treatment so horizontal equity is basically equality. And you've got vertical equity, which is actually equity. They use those terms interchangeably. I don't know why. Um, so people that often come up in short answer questions and they talk about poor access to healthcare, you've got Indigenous Australians, refugees, people with a disability, and people living in a rural or remote area. So those will, be, those will come up a lot in your short answer questions. Indigenous health. So Indigenous populations experience health inequity because of many factors. Some of them are, so they generally, this is actually really hard to talk about, um, a lot of Indigenous populations will have a large population that has a low socioeconomic background. Um, they face racism and discrimination. They often have less employment opportunities um, and poorer housing. 
a lot of Indigenous populations will be found living in regional, rural or remote areas, not all, but most. Um, therefore, they have poor access to resources, healthcare, education, clean water, sanitation, everything. And Australia has a fairly culturally insensitive healthcare structure, so they experience health inequity. 2.5% of the population is Indigenous, so it's important to consider that all the time. And a key part of the uh, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander identity criteria is that you have to be of ATSI descent, you have to identify as ATSI, and you have to be accepted by the ATSI community. So they must, so a person, in order to be considered Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, they have to have those three categories met. Cultural safety, which is important. This comes up in um, short answer questions all the time. So cultural blindness is where you treat everyone the same regardless of cultural influences. So that can lead to miscommunications and institutionalised racism, which is both not good. Cultural safety, on the other hand, is ensuring respect for cultural and social differences. So using translators, using Indigenous health workers, and just being mindful in general. Prevention, health prevention. Upstream approach is always best. There's no question about it. Prevention aims to eradicate, eliminize, or minimize. What did I just say? Aims to eradicate, eliminate, or minimize the impact of disease and disability. Um, usually, it's more effective to focus on the whole population than specific small groups of high-risk individuals just because you're more likely to reach more people. Um, you've got four levels of prevention. Primordial, which is preventing risk factors, so that's things like legislation. You've got primary risk factors, so it's modifying the risk factors, so slip, slop, slap. Secondary is lifestyle modification, so screening programs, and tertiary um, prevention, which is rehabilitation, so things to prevent further complications in someone who already has the disease. That's really blurry, but yes. Yes, so upstream approach, I don't know if you guys have used the analogy, but there's basically a river, and you've got upstream, midstream, downstream. So upstream is basically where you're trying to change the um, economic and political environment so people have better access to health, better access to resources, and better health over, overall. Midstream is where you're targeting um, communities, and then downstream is where you're targeting individuals. So it's not as effective if you're only targeting individuals because you can only affect one person. Communities, more effective, but still not great because you're targeting specific communities. Upstream is the best because you're targeting a whole population. Yes. Yes, because that's a specific community. Cool. Um, so refugee and asylum seeker health. Refugee is considered a person who's been forced to leave their country to escape war, persecution, or natural disaster. Whereas an asylum seeker is a person who's left their country to seek asylum. They've applied for refuge, but they haven't been granted refugee status. So that's an important distinction between the two. They are not interchangeable, as a lot of people think. I thought that, but no, they're not. Australia's healthcare system is currently unsustainable because you've got a lot of, you've got an aging population. So there's a lot of people retiring and there's not a lot of people coming into the workforce. Um, therefore, you have a disproportionately large ageing population and they face a lot of non-communicable diseases, NCDs, um, which are chronic. You've got lower birth rates. Um, the healthcare system is very expensive because you've got a lot of pharmaceuticals and technologies that are constantly being developed. Um, you don't have enough healthcare professionals, which we're trying to fix. Um, the healthcare system doesn't focus a lot on preventative health, it focuses more on treatment, which means it's not as effective because that's midstream and downstream, not upstream. And a large proportion of health funding is basically redundant because it's not targeting the right things. That's HKS. We've got questions at the end for all of them, so you guys can practice all your knowledge, but I'm just gonna get through everything. Okay, medicine of the mind. <laughs> He is Kermit, okay? It's not just me. Um, okay, so we're going to cover mind-body relationships, learning theories, de developmental theories, stress, again, prevention and change, and pain. Okay, we'll be quick. 
Okay, so attribution. So attribution is the process of inferring a cause of your mental state or behavior, either on yourself or on others or your environment. So you've got external or situational attribution. It's mostly called situational attribution. Um, so it's a certain behavior is occurring because of your the demands of a certain situation. So you're only doing something because the situation demands it. Internal attribution is where the behavior reflects the person's personality or abilities. So you are behaving this way because this is how you are and this is what you're capable of doing. Stable versus unstable attribution. So stable attribution is the stability of reasoning. Unstable is making excuses. So stable, you're using logical reasoning. Unstable is making excuses. Global versus specific. Global is obviously attributing it to everything. So this is happening because everything. Um, specific is this is happening because of specific things. And then controllable versus uncontrollable. So whether or not the behavior can be con controlled. Stop looking at the person at the back. <laughs> Just say hello and move on. Okay, so you've got errors of attribution. So you've got your you've got your fundamental attribution error. So fundamental attribution error is the tendency for people observing. Guys, stop looking at the back. <laughs> Look at me. So fundamental attribution error is the tendency for people observing to underestimate the impact of external attribution and overestimate the impact of internal attribution. So it's basically, oh, she fixed it. Um, so it's basically saying that someone is depressed because they're lazy and can't keep a job. So they're saying it's because of that person's internal attributes, so their personality and their abilities, not factoring in external factors. And so, yeah, so that's just an error that can happen. And then you've got actor observer bias. So the tendency for the person who's doing the, doing the behavior to favor the external attributions for their own behavior. And this happens a lot if it's negative behavior. So for example, I got sick because my boss told me to take a shift and I work too hard, not because I don't sleep and I don't eat a proper diet. So they're sort of the opposite. So fundamental attribution is where you underestimate external and overestimate internal. Whereas actor observer is where you overestimate external and underestimate internal. So it's just flipped. Self-serving bias. It's biases that protect or enhance self-evaluation. So self-enhancing bias is attributing one's success to personal factors. So saying, I got 100% because I'm a bloody genius. Self-protecting bias is attributing one's failures to situational factors. I failed the exam because my friends took me out to a party the night before and I got drunk. That's their fault, not mine. Self-handicapping bias is publicly making advanced external attributions for your anticipated poor behavior or um, failure. So saying before the exam, I'm going to fail because my computer broke down and I couldn't study. Yes. They are, they're pretty similar except What's the difference? Hmm. Ah, actor observer bias can be positive or negative behavior. So for example, you can say, I did amazing because I studied with my friends and they're amazing people. So it can go both ways. Whereas ah, self-protecting bias is only talking about failures. So it's saying I failed because the world blew up. That's an extreme case, but okay. Moving on. <laughs> so cognitive dissonance is where you have a discrepancy between your attitudes or a discrepancy between an attitude and a behavior and it, really, and it leads to psychological tension. So basically you've got a thought, vaccination will protect me, but they can also cause autism. So therefore you have a thought, I wanna be protected, but I don't wanna be autistic. So you're less likely to vaccinate in that case because you want to do something good. So it's, it's a discrepancy between your attitudes. So you've got a thought, so you've got two thoughts. Vaccination will be protecting, protective, but it could cause autism. You want to be protected, but you don't want to be autistic. 
so you have less fact, less likely to vaccinate. So cognitive dissonance is something that will happen a lot in real life. Learning theories. So you've got two. You've got classical and operant conditioning. So classical conditioning is where you have an unconditioned stimulus, so something that produces a response without any learning. You've got an unconditioned response, so just something that you so it's just a response that you have naturally. You've got a conditioned stimulus where it elicits the conditioned response, and you've got a conditioned response, which is the response that happens. That's hard to understand, but this picture makes it easier. So food is your unconditioned stimulus, and the unconditioned response is salivation in a dog or in a person. Um, so you've got the, so that's before conditioning. So you haven't done anything, that's just a natural response. Then you've got a neutral stimulus, which is the whistle, you pair that and you have no response because you hear a whistle, you're not going to salivate. But then during conditioning, you pair a neutral stimulus with an unconditioned stimulus and you get the unconditioned response. So you blow the whistle and there's food. They will salivate. Eventually, after learning and classical conditioning, they will respond with the conditioned response, which is the salivation, on just the presentation of the conditioned stimulus. Just understand that. Learning theories. This one's sort of weird to wrap your mind around, but operant conditioning, you've got reinforcement and punishment. So reinforcement is where the consequences will increase the, ch the chance that the behaviour is repeated. So if you've got positive reinforcement, you do something good and you give them something. So you do something good, I give you a lolly. Negative re reinforcement is when you do something bad and then you take away something. Yes. Punishment is consequences that will decrease the chances that the beh behaviour is repeated. So positive punishment is when you do something bad, something is given. No, that's wrong. When you do something, you punish them, so you give them something bad. So you park in the wrong spot and you get a fine. That is positive punishment. Negative punishment is when you do something bad and then something bad is taken away to punish you. So you speed and you lose your license. You've taken away something. That's something good. I don't know. Anyway, my brain's not working. That's fine. So you've got punishment and re you've got reinforcement and punishment. So reinforcement is good. Punishment is bad. The positive and negative you have to think about is whether or not something is being given or something is being taken away. Yes. Something bad is being taken away. Negative reinforcement is basically you do well on your exam, I will take away something bad. I will take away global warming, if I can do that. So that's increasing the chance that your behaviour is repeated. So you do something good and then I take away something bad. So you've got something bad in your life you want taken away, I will take it away if you do something good. So negative punishment, yes. It's something good is taken away. Sorry, I should change that. Negative punishment is something good is taken away. So I take away your license if you speed. Does that make sense? I wrote it down wrong. I'll fix that, don't worry. Okay, so this is classical versus operant conditioning. It's pretty straightforward. I'm not gonna go through these because there's no easy way to learn these. You just sort of have to learn them. Um, but Freud was fucking weird and <laughs> I don't know why he divided the life stage of a person's development into oral, anal, phallic, latency, genital, but he did. Um, and apparently we stopped developing after 12, so that's cool. So if you see those, Freud, and Erickson's is basically talking about um, what you are learning in specific stages. So they're saying from birth to the first year of life, you're learning trust or mistrust. From one to three years, you're learning autonomy or shame. And then three to six years, et cetera, et cetera. So that's Erickson's psychosocial theory is talking about what you're learning in each stage of your life. Freud's is just weird. Um, this is a cognitive development theory. So this is talking about what types of things you're learning. So in the first two years, they're saying you're learning all through your senses and your actions. And then from two to six, you're starting to represent objects with words 
and images. So you're starting to associate things. Um, from six to early adolescence, they're saying that you're thinking more logically. And then from adolescence onwards, you're thinking about abstract thoughts. So that's talking about what you're able to sort of think about in your mind at what stage. These are newborn reflexes. Please learn them. They do come up. You don't think they do. They will. They will ask you what... Did you guys do this? Ah, that's fun. Don't learn these. <laughs> did you do this? Cool. Okay. Just look at the picture then. Okay. Stress. Um, we already talked about stress, but stress, you've got acute and chronic. Um, so you've got the Holmes and Ra life events theory. We're almost done. We're almost done. Um, so the life events theory is talking about that specific life events will have effects on external stress. So if so, and it measures it with actual numerical values. I don't think you have to know this, but just sort of understand that something that is more a more important life event will have a more um, a larger impact on your health. So obviously, the death of a spouse will have a larger impact on your health than Christmas. Internal stress, you've got external, internal stress. Internal stress is how your body responds to stress. So you've got sympathetic versus parasympathetic, fight or flight versus rest or digest. And it's looking at your nerve, nervous system and neurosystem. Transactional stress, not that important, but it basically considers the nature of the stress and then the nature of the person who experiences that stress. So you've got to appraise the stress response. So you've got primary appraisal, which is how you appraise the stress or the event, so how stressful you think the event is going to be. And then secondary is how you, um, how, how you think your resources and your ability to cope will help you with that. So that's what I was talking about before. So there's factors that will influence it. Um, timing, so when the event occurs, predictability of the event, perceived control, the amount of life change required, previous history, your current mental state, and if you have any anxiety already. Impacts of stress. You can have behavioural, organisational, cognitive, emotional, or physical effects. They all, they're all up there. Um, the factors that will modify the impact of stress will be social support, coping, personality, your ability to control things, and any depression or anxiety the person might already have. Stress and illness. So stress has a direct root of illness and an indirect root of illness. So it can cause direct physiological changes to your immune system or it can um, be indirect because of the responses, it, the impacts it has. So if you're stressed, you're more likely to drink, smoke, overeat, undereat and have personal responses and that can also impact your health. Personality and stress. Um, so if you have certain personalities, you are more or less likely to be stressed. So if you are a hostile person, you're more likely to be stressed. If you're a neurotic person, you're more likely to um, be stressed. If you're an optimistic person, you're less likely to be stressed. And if you're a hardy person, you're less likely to be stressed as well. Coping strategies. That's my coping strategy. Um, so you've got problem versus emotion. <laughs> Jalen's coping strategy. Um, it's problem versus emotion focused coping. So if you've got problem focused, it's talking about planning, confronting and seeking information to cope. Emotion focused is seeking support, venting to someone, praying or reframing your mind, state of mind basically. Um, and you've got a few cognitive responses. You, people will feel helpless, people will accept it or people will add optimistic meaning. So trying to perceive benefits from stress or stressful events. Pain. <clears throat> so you, everyone's got a pain threshold, which is similar. So it's where the stimulus becomes painful. But pain tolerance is different for everyone. So the degree of tolerance to a painful stimulus. So everyone has the same receptors on their skin that will tolerate heat. But everyone reacts to that differently. People, some people will get really hot really fast. Some people will, get, will find it, not find it hot until it's 45 degrees. Um, gate control theory of pain, there's no real way, the only way to explain this is that you open the gate when there's activity in the pain fibres and you close the gate when there's activity in other sensory nerves. 
So there. So you've got touching the affected area closes the gate. So things that will open the gate and cause more pain will be if you, like if you get stabbed and you have negative thoughts and you keep remembering the pain, then you'll get more and more pain. But things to try and lessen the pain will be obviously if you get stabbed, you get medication, you get tranquilizers, you get antidepressants, things like meditation, trying to distract yourself from the pain, and I don't know how this fits in with stabbing, but um, aerobic exercise will make things less painful. Um, the, gate, the gate control theory of pain can account for the fact that you can have injury without pain and you can have pain without injury. Okay, ethics and law, this is super fast. We're just gonna cover ethical theories, principles, and basically consent, which I hope to God you guys already know. Okay, ethical theories, you've got utilit, I can't even say this word, utilitarianism. So it's where you want the greatest good for the greatest number of people. So basically it's the theory where you kill one person to save a million. Rights-based ethics is deciding an action based on the idea that people have certain rights and there are universal wrongs. So the right to life, for example. So that wouldn't, so you couldn't kill that person to save a million because that one person still has a right to life. The virtue ethics is what is considered right based on what a virtuous person would do. That one's a bit stupid, the other two are more relevant. Medical ethics, you've got non-maleficence, pretty basic, don't do any harm. Beneficence, also pretty basic, always aim to do good things. Autonomy is the right for people to make their own decisions even if it's not in their best interest, for example, not taking care or not taking treatment, it's still their right. And justice, people deserve fair and equal treatment in similar situations and people who are in worse situations might need more help than other people. So that's the idea of medical equity. Paternalism, you've got strong and weak. So medical paternalism, if you've got strong, it's where you've got an intervention to benefit a patient despite the fact that they've voluntary, informed, and capable refusal. Yes. Whereas you've got, so that is not good. So strong paternalism is bad. Weak paternalism is where you undergo an intervention to benefit a patient who is suspected of not being capable of making an autonomous decision. So someone who's unconscious, or someone who you think is being coerced, or someone who is drunk, for example. So weak paternalism, is acceptable in some cases. Strong paternalism is never acceptable, it's a bad thing. Battery and negligence, pretty straightforward. Tort of battery is basically any form of intentional contact without the patient's consent. So even if you touch them, that is called battery. Physical injury, therefore, is not necessary. It might occur, but it's not necessary. Negligence, on the other hand, is a breach of, duty, breach of your duty of care, which results in an unintended injury. And you have to have four things. You need to have the duty of care. The doctor has to breach the duty of care. The injury that occurs has to be a direct result of that breach of duty of care. And the injury had to have been prevent preventable. So you had to have been able to foresee that. But again, it was unintentional. Consent. Consent can be oral or written. Big thing, can be oral or written. So it has to be voluntary, has to be informed, and the patient has to have the capacity to be giving that. So therefore they have to be of, that should be sound, be of sound mind. They must not be under the influence of anything and they have to be over 18. You can have implied consent, however. So it becomes, that's important when people aren't uh, unconscious, for example, and they're brought into the emergency room. So implied consent um, happens when there's an emergency or when there's a necessity. So emergency is when you're performing a life-saving procedure to avoid any further danger or necessity is when any reasonable person would consider it necessary to perform this treatment. Confidentiality, pretty straightforward. You can disclose patient information if the patient consents, it's de-identified, it's being shared within only healthcare people, um, there, or there is a threat to public safety, and or if the patient throw, poses a threat to themselves, so if they're suicidal, for example. Um, that's when a doctor may disclose information, but a doctor must disclose information if there's a notifiable disease, if there's malpractice, if there's things like child abuse or child drugs or drink driving, um, if they've been asked by the court or the police, if it's a reportable death, or if there is a threat to public health safety.
and that would be something like a notifiable disease. Oh, I went backwards. Reportable deaths. They are anything that's unexpected, unnatural, violent, or accidental. And for a medical um, student, that would be occurring during a medical procedure. And it could be, for example, if someone's in jail, so they're in the care or custody of the Justice Department. Um, reportable deaths are also if you don't know who the person is. Um, and also any resident in a psychiatric ward is a reportable death. Okay, we've got some practice questions. We got time? Yes, we do. Okay, so just some tips. Exam questions for these topics are usually short answer. You don't really need to know specifics except for some of the statistics. Just have a good understanding, be able to sort of explain it. Um, if you're not a crazy person, you should be able to answer the ethics questions fairly straightforward. Um, and they're usually very small sections. So don't stress, there's usually like only 10 questions in the whole thing. Okay, quick. Richard has realized that his diet of just toast and hummus is not good and he's come to visit you for advice on how to be a better person. What would cover a SMART goal? Which one's a SMART goal? A, B, C, D. Just yell. D, cool, it's D, because it's, yeah, specific, measurable, attractive, realistic, and timely. That's Jalen for anyone who doesn't know. Say hi. <laughs> okay, Jalen has realized that perhaps he drinks too much. Um, he visits you and tells you that he would not like to drink so much. What stage of the cycle of change is he at right now? A, B, C, or D, yell, yell at me. D, cool, contemplation. What is negative reinforcement? Here we go. A, B, C, or D? I'm hearing 50 different things. It's B. So because it's reinforcement, you want them to continue to do this action, so you're praising the action, and it's negative, so you're taking something away. External attribution. See? Yes. So self-protecting, intentionally making it aware to others. Yeah, okay. So the first one is actually self-handicapping. So ex intentionally making it aware to others that external factors have led to a failure. Actor observer is someone blaming external attributions for their own behavior. Self-enhancing is not self-enhancing, it's self-protecting. And the last one is self-enhancing, attributing success to personal factors. <laughs> which is not a feature of fight or flight. So I think, what is rest and digest? What is it? D. Uh, yes, rest and digest. Everything else is fight or flight. Does that make sense? Yeah, so increased peristalsis is like esophag as your esophagus is moving food down. So digesting food. So using alcohol as a coping strategy is which type? A, B, C, or D? Take a guess. Most of this is logical. What? D? Yes. Because you're avoiding coping. You're not actually trying to cope. You're just avoiding the problem. This has actually happened. Just FYI. So what is the conditioned stimulus? So it's the thing that didn't have a response before. Trains, yeah. So he was not scared of trains before. There was no response, but now because of the conditioned res condition, conditioning, classical conditioning, he's now scared of trains. It's actually trams, but anyway. A, B, C, or D? C? Yes. So you're being punished and you're being given something. So positive punishment. 
this one's mean, but this was actually from last year's exam. So which is not an element. What are people saying? C? Yes. So it's low fat vegetarian diet. They will do this to you. This is something that's actually been done. This was a question from two years ago, I think. Clearly Craig wrote this question. So which one is not considered being mindful? C, yes, because technically you're multitasking. You're doing two things at once. You're coloring in and listening to music. If you were truly being mindful, you would either color in in silence or listen to your favorite music with your eyes closed and appreciate that music. So this is an example of a short answer question. So some patients prefer not to be given details of treatment alternatives and their risks of harm. So they ask a doctor who they have a reason to trust to use their judgment. What should a doctor do in this case? Now, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to show you what we should do. Um, so you should weigh up the ethical principles. You ensure that they have an understanding, but you also respect their decision not to be informed about certain things. So you still need to respect their autonomy. Um, you also make sure that there is, you need to maintain beneficence and non-maleficence. So make sure that you're still trying to do good and there is, you're minimizing the risk for harm. Um, but legally, you're still obliged to make sure that they have a basic understanding, even though they might not want to be informed of all the details. And so you should always write down that the patient declined to be informed of the specific details so that if it is ever brought up later, you have proof. Yes. Um, this kind of question would be three or four marks. So again, a tip, how many marks the question is, how many points you should bring up, at least. Obviously, don't bring up like 20 points in a five mark question, because if you get one wrong, they'll still take away a mark. What is medical paternalism? So medical paternalism is the idea that the doctor knows best. So there's two types, strong and weak. So this would be a three mark question. One, what is medical paternalism and the two types? You can read that later, don't worry. Primary health care, what is it? If there's ever all of the above, it's always all of the above. <laughs> Just a tip, they're not gonna put that there. It's not always none of the above though, that's a trick they do. A, B, C, D, E. I just told you, it's E. Tip test, remember that. Yeah, no, Lena's still here. So this would be a three or four mark question, for example. So a rural GP working with a pop small population. So remote is important. High percentage of Indigenous Australians is important to consider for barriers of access. So you've got geographic location, you've got cultural barriers, and you've got inferred low socioeconomic status because of what we learned about Indigenous Australians. So there's three. Oh, this one's mean. A, B, C, D, E. I see a B, yes, it is B. It's not health inequality, it's health inequity. Again, this was an actual question, so all those O's is true. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? A, B, C, D, E. Anyone? C, yes. Secondary. All screening programs are secondary. Quaternary doesn't exist. That's just there. There you go. Where would you deal with problems within the community? Up, mid, downstream. The waterfall is technically correct, but not according to the med faculty. Upstream. 
always deal with things upstream. So try and change the economic and political environment. Yes. Huh? Yes. So midstream is behavioural, so like community, and then downstream is biological. Yeah, within the community, as in I'm talking about like within the Australian population. Sorry, they weird they they word questions like that. The answer is C. Yes, unless they say if you're like curing one person, what sort of treatment is this considered? That would be downstream. But if they're talking about best way, it's always upstream. So methods to improve equity. These sort of questions you can be imaginative because they don't technically exist. They're not asking you what measures are there already. It's saying what are methods, methods that could improve. So you've got things like health service funding proportional to household income, for example, um, providing Aboriginal health workers, providing transportation services for rural remote communities, and free um, healthcare for the first year of a refugee moving to Australia. Just some examples. Again, that would probably be like a four or five mark question. Yes. Yes. They don't ask you about international health yet. That's it. Any questions? Cool. Bye. Yes. Oh no, I think that's one. Um, I don't have my glasses. I forgot my glasses. Nice, you got my glasses. Do you want to see? Yeah, no, I didn't realize the other glasses. Oh, do you not see? Yeah. We are all dead. No, you have to be done with the kids. Wait, what? It's a bathroom of. right now and there's a lot of content to get through so we'll just start now um, so genetics uh, you guys had a revision lecture I think during mid -sense, or before then um, about this as well so this is like a bit of a rehash about that um, so oh before we start you, if anyone came to my PSP they would have already seen this video but I'm just gonna play it again cuz like <laughs> Yeah, and you guys have bombs, so like... <laughs> Cute. Thanks, Karen. Um, no, I don't... I don't so, um, this is a relatively dry piece of content in your coursework, so we're just going to try to spice it as much as possible. Um, so, what we're going to cover today is central dogma, patterns of inheritance, patterns analysis of population genetics, 
and genetic mutations and chromosomal abnormalities. We're not going to cover the fifth one because I think that was already covered in your biochem thing today. Yes? No? No. Okay, well, in that case, I'll put up post slides with notes on that because we don't have enough time to go over biotech and it's pretty low yield anyways. Cool. Um, so in the framework of this PowerPoint, I'm going to be using the Chinese bootleg version of Star Wars Episode 3 that's been retranslated back into English. Um, so starting off with central dogma. So the sections of learning in central dogma, the, basically the way the lecture was structured was structure, organization, replication, DNA, RNA synthesis and processing, and protein synthesis. In other words, the three main steps of central dogma, which is duplication, transcription, and translation. And you guys would have seen that diagram to death. So there you go. Cool. So part one, the duplication, basically. Structure, organization, and duplication of DNA. So first thing you guys need to understand is the structure of DNA. It's a nucleotide monomer. So the actual nucleotide is composed of a nitrogenous base, uh, adenine, cytosine, thymine, and guanine. So you know that A, C, C, G, they pair together. Um, you also get the phosphate group and the sugar deoxyribose head, which is going to be important later when we talk about the differences between RNA and DNA. Cool. So in the structure of DNA, um, what you guys have is the double-stranded helix polymer. Actually, hold on a second. Karan, how do you do the notes presentation thing? Okay, cool, cheers. Um, so in terms of the DNA polymer, it's basically all those nucleotide polymers that's been like put together. Um, and it's a double-stranded helix polymer. And you have the sugar phosphate backbone, which are the rungs of the ladder, and the nitrogenous spaces, which are the, like, the, the sides of the ladder, and the nitrogenous spaces, which are the rungs, which is a really crappy metaphor because ladders aren't in double helix shape. Um, so the nitrogenous bases are held together by the weak H bonds, which means that they're easily denatured, which is important for duplication. And it has a right-hand twist and is anti-parallel. So those are just a few buzzwords. Um, yeah, you guys see nucleotide, polymer, there you go. So the essential functions of DNA is information storage. That's the foremost. If you guys don't have DNA, basically your body doesn't know what to do to make your body. So pretty important. Um, it's also essential in replication. Well, it replicates so you can like to keep your body uh, alive. Um, it's also important in gene expression and mutations in genetic variation. So when we talk about these essential functions, we can relate it to the actual um, structures on the DNA. So the information storage is mainly enacted by the phosphoribose backbone. So it's covalently attached, which means that it's very solidly attached, and that stores information long term. Replication, because you have complementary base pairing, you know that if you have one strand, you can replicate the other strand in, anti, in an anti-parallel fashion. Gene expression, if you have weak pairing, that means it's easily denatured, which means that you can kind of express those genes. It's locked up otherwise. And you have mutations and genetic variations. Now, we're not actually going to talk about this because that is a, it's a really weird piece of content. Um, I'll talk to you about it later when we come to the questions. Cool. So in terms of DNA storage, the way DNA is stored is in chromosomes. But to get to that point, there's like a bit of a process. So you have two meters of DNA basically in each cell, and that needs to be contacted to like a cellular level. So what happens is that the DNA winds around this histone protein, those proteins, and that becomes a nucleosome. Now the nucleosome compresses and is condensed into chromatin, which is like these things here. And the chromatin is compacted during mitosis and meiosis into chromosomes. Now these chromosomes, when you see them on images, are going to be like the metaphase because like that's when it's most clearly like condensed. That's when it's, the chromosomes are most condensed. So if you guys see a question about that, you guys will know. Cool. Now we get to actual DNA replication, and this occurs during the synthesis phase of the cell cycle. I'm pretty sure you guys have done this part to death in your active learnings, so we'll skip this. And yeah, of course, mitosis, meiosis. I'm not going to go over that. You guys should know this from biology or just learning it. Um, so, do you guys all know mitosis, meiosis? Okay, okay, someone's shaking their head. Um, cool. So, we get to DNA replication, which is basically the key word you need to know about this is the semi conservative model. So, what happens is this is that you get a parent strand acting as a template. So, the strand basically denatures, becomes a single parent strand, and then nucleos nucleotides get added to the parent strand to produce a daughter. DNA strand, yeah. So the replicated DNA helix in this situation would be one parent strand and then one new, newly synthesized strand. And so basically two replicated helices have one strand of parent helix each. Cool. 
All good so far? Nice. Um, so the mechanism of DNA replication, so you guys will need to know these steps because it can come up. Um, the DNA helicase, so that unwinds DNA, right? So it becomes these like kind of single strands here. You get these single strand binding proteins which bind to the strands to prevent them from coming together. Remember because there's H bonds acting. So you kind of use these things to stabilize the unwound strands. Then you get the RNA's primase enzyme, which synthesizes RNA primers. Now the thing is, DNA polymerase can't just start binding to the strands and start synthesizing DNA by itself. What it needs to do is it actually needs the RNA primer to start the process and the DNA polymerase will finish it. So in this sense, you need the primase enzyme to generate the RNA primers, which is 18 to 22 bases, and they attach to the strand, which is here like here, and then the DNA polymerase will start building on the primer by catalyzing the addition of free nucleotides. So it always builds five prime to three prime, but it'll read three prime to five prime. Yeah? Cool. Um, Karan, take a laptop if you want. You can take a laptop if you want, yeah. Um, so the mechanism is continued. So it starts building in the five prime to three prime. Uh, well, because the DNA polymerase is a five prime to three prime action, it produces a leading and lagging strand. And that's because the leading strand over here will start growing continuously, but the lagging strand, because it's growing, it's like it's going to be produced in the opposite direction, it will kind of have to use a different mechanism. So in the macroscope of this picture, it's still being produced from it's being produced from three prime to five prime, but in the microscopic structure, it has to be produced five prime to three prime. So what happens to counteract this action is that you get these primers laying down. And you get these fragments instead of like a continuous chain called Okazaki fragments. And that's what, that's what allows DNA replication to kind of occur in the three prime to five prime direction. Now, at this point, you get RNA's H, which degrades the primers, so these things just break off. And our DNA polymerase has to fill in the sections because you don't want RNA in your DNA. And DNA ligase at this point connect the Okazaki fragments. So you guys get a bit of a break here, and DNA ligase will connect that. Cool. So that's replication. Now we're going to go to synthesis and processing, which is basically transcription. So to understand this first, you guys will have questions on these, which is really crappy because you guys will never see this again, but you have RNA versus DNA. Now RNA is single-stranded, DNA is double-stranded. RNA has a uracil base, DNA has a thymine base. RNA has a ribose sugar, which I didn't even know what it meant until yesterday when I looked over these, which means that deoxyribase does not have the O. And that's the only reason why, I remember, like, the only way you can remember is like deoxy, so there's no O, which apparently makes it more like unstable, so you need like bind it in double strand. And with RNA, it folds into 3D structures, whereas in DNA, it's a helix shape. And there's, there's going to be questions that come up about the types of RNA that can be produced, like messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA, transfer RNA. So just study what types there are in the cell and the human body, and then just understand what's not DNA. Cool. Um, yep, low quality. Uh, so translation, the tra look, sorry, transcription. Translation is later. Sorry, I'll fix those slides up. But transcription is DNA directed RNA synthesis in the nucleus. And I'm emphasizing these words because the location of where these processes come up could be important. So there's three phases in transcription: initiation, elongation, and termination. So the initiation, the RNA polymerase uses one strand of DNA as a template strand. So what happens is you have these promoter sequences on the DNA that, rec that allows the RNA polymerase to recognize and bind to it. Yeah, so these sequences, RNA polymerase will bind to it. Now, at this point, RNA polymerase will start unwinding the DNA and it reads the template in a three prime to five prime direction. But remember, all the polymerases synthesize in a five prime to three prime direction. It'll start building the RNA like this and it'll kind of peel away. And the transcribed DNA is rewound by the DNA polymerase. At a certain point, you'll get a stop codon, so like UAA, UAG, all those ones, and that stops the process. It specifies where to stop the um, reading of the DNA. And the RNA polymerase just dissociates from the DNA. And at this stage, you don't get the mRNA, you get the pre-mRNA. Now, RNA products, you get messenger RNA, which codes for a protein, ribosomal RNA, which combines to the structure, which contributes to the structure and function of ribosomes, and you also get transfer RNA, which basically carry an amino acid and like has an adapter molecule called a anticodon, which um, 
connect to the ribosome to allow the production of proteins. We'll talk about that later in translation. Cool. So the modification of pre-RNA, this is lower yield, but basically all you need to know is that methyl is added to the 5' prime and poly is added to the 3'. Prime. The way I remembered it is methyl has more letters, so higher number, 5', prime, poly, less letters, 3' prime, added to the 3'. Prime. You also have introns, which are non-coding regions. And this really like messed with me because I thought introns, like in my head I had this stupid mnemonic that said introns are in, which means they're in the thing, but apparently that's not. Um, so I, now I just remember it as like exons, it's what's expressed. So that's what's in the actual final mRNA. So exons, what's expressed. Introns, remove other spliceosome. Cool. Now we get to protein synthesis, which is translation. Now, before we actually move on to the steps of translation, I want to go over a few molecules that are important in this process. So first of all, you have the tRNA. tRNA. And basically, what this does, it interacts with the protein, the amino acid, and the ribosome. So it carries an anticodon, which recognizes a codon on the DNA. And the tRNA is, well, reads mRNA via an anticodon complementary contact point. Look, it's just this thing, like anticodons, codons, they just bind three at a time. And the tRNA itself is bound to a specific amino acid. So if you think about the tRNA molecule, it's the transfer adapted molecule, right? So it'll bind to the RNA and it'll also bind to the amino acid, which allows the production of proteins from the RNA. Any questions about that? Cool. Um, and then you have the ribosome, which is the, basically the site where all the protein is being synthesized. And you have three sites, the APE, and then, well, you just remember APE. Um, amino acid, P, polypeptide, and E, exit. Cool. Um, so in translation, what we have first, so translation is RNA-directed polypeptide synthesis in the cytoplasm. So transcription occurred in the nucleus, translation is in the cytoplasm. So the mechanism of this is that you activate your tRNAs first and the amino acid activation of tRNA. So you get the three prime end of the tRNA molecule bound to specific amino acid. You don't need to know what end, just know that tRNA is bound to a specific amino acid. And this produces a charged tRNA molecule, which is when the tRNA is bound to an amino acid. Then you get to initiation. So there's an initiation complex which binds the first tRNA and amino acid with the ribosome and the mRNA. Remember, you need like the information, the adapter, and the mechanism to produce it. Then you get a start codon, right, which designates the first amino acid in all proteins. So AEG, remember that. Elongation, it just basically starts building amino acids. So amino acids, tRNAs will come in at the A point, it will be added to the polypeptide joint at the P point, and it will exit through the E point. And the ribosome kind of like does this thing where it like keeps on going down to enable new codons to be read. Eventually, you'll get to a stop codon, UAA, UAG, UGA. You also should remember these just in case you get questions in the exam. And it binds to a release factor, and it just tells everything to like, sort off and then it becomes the protein kill. Now, you also get gene expression control. If you can't tell, I really hate central dogma. Um, I just think it's unnecessary. Don't. <laughs> Keep that on deal. Um, so transcriptional factors. Transcription, so you can also modulate transcription. During transcription, the expression of genes. So if you bind to like, you know, d regulatory DNA sections, it will tell like, the RNA polymerase to not bind to it. So if you don't have those like promoter sequences, then the RNA polymerase can't bind to it and it can't produce that protein eventually. Protein transcription is like the splicing of exons. So if you have like things that you don't want, um, alternative splicing of exons. So if you want things to be expressed differently, you would splice the exons, the stuff that ends up in the eventual RNA molecule differently. Translation, so it'll bind to mRNAs that don't need to be translated and post-translational, basically after you get the protein, you can modify it like folding, all that stuff to change its function. And there's also a thing called ubiquitin and it attaches to the proteins you don't need and breaks it down via proteases. This is, I would say semi-relevant, but I'd say if you don't have time to revise and just like kind of know that where these like things can occur, like cytoplasm nucleus, because those are like keywords that could come up in the question. Cool, we're gonna go over some questions now. Um, just shout out the answer when you know it. Oh, these questions are pretty tough, by the way, because, like, I don't know. I just 
put tough questions in. Can someone say C? A? Yep, A is, A is correct. <laughs> um, so transcription occurs before translation. Sorry to mess that slide up. But okay, question two. Okay, this is mean because I didn't actually teach you this, but the answer is D. Um, so purines and pyrimidines have a analogous structure, which basically means that, so purines are like A and G, and pyrimidines are T and C. And basically what that means is that in the base pairing, these things can kind of get like switched around, which causes substitution mutations and point mutations, which causes mutations. Like, and that is supposed to be good for genetic variety. Someone say B? Okay. Yep, it's B. So RNA to protein is translation. Someone say A? Yep, question is A. So with these questions, there's like a lot of reading to do. So basically, all you have to do is look at what's different. So look at the last two and the first two steps. If they're in order, no, it's correct. Cool. A patient is seen to have a lot, oh, that one as well is just, that's just content. You need to go back and remember the steps. A patient is seen to have a loss of function mutation in the single strand binding proteins. What is the most likely effect of this? C? Yep, C. So, oh, I didn't have the answer. Well, the answer is C. Um, but yeah, single strand proteins prevent annealing. Did someone say A? A and D are both incorrect. So remember, methyl, more letters, so five prime, poly, less letters, three prime. Cool, patterns of inheritance. Um, people who watch Star Wars will understand that. Okay, so there's a lot of terminology in patterns of inheritance. So trait is a characteristic. Phenotype is the appearance. So phenotype and genotype really screwed with me a bit, but phenotype is like the appearance of the organism, how it manifests. Genotype is the actual genetic composition of the organism. The gene is a region of DNA, and the allele is the alternate version of the same gene. Locus is like a location. You can tell by locus. Homozygote, so same allele at the, at the same locus. Heterozygote, two different alleles, like capital A, lowercase a. Cool. Running through the traits, we have recessive traits. So the key word is this, is that recessive traits can skip a generation. So because you can have carriers that carry the trait, it means it can be expressed in the next generation and not be expressed in one generation. Dominant, if it doesn't get expressed, that means it's no longer existent in the pedigree. Cool. Now, the main model of inheritance is Mendelian inheritance. So basically that's talking about all your pedigree tables and how you have a single gene disorder or trait, and eventually how you, you get like crossbreeding and stuff and you get like the passing down of like recessive and dominant genes. So basically the whole concept of Mendelian inheritance is like the dominant and recessive things. Cool. Um, so we're going to be talking about some of the patterns of inheritance now. So these are like just things you would have done in active learnings. So first thing you have is autosomal inheritance, which is on a non-sex cell. So autosomal dominance is always going to be, well, basically it won't skip generations and it's manifested in heterozygotes and homozygotes if you get capital A, capital A. And because it's autosomal, you get equal representation in men and women. Autosomal recessive, it manifests in homozygotes, so only lowercase a's, 
and it can skip generations and again equal representation of men and women. Cool. Pseudo dominance. So this is also really confusing, but it's when a recessive trait mimics the patterns of inheritance of a dominant trait. So if you look at this, this would be an example of a pseudo dominant gene because you have the guy who's expressing it and you also have the guy that's carrying it. But then in this, it won't skip a generation and it will still have continuous expression. So an example of this is if you have an affected person and a carrier breeding. So instead of the usual 25% that we see in recessive traits, instead we see 50% expression as we do in more dominant traits. Cool. You also get sex-linked inheritance. So X-linked. So these are kind of hard to differentiate. So X-linked recessive and X-linked dominant. Um, but if it's X-linked dominant, then a male with a trait means that n no sons will be affected. Because if it's a daughter, the male is passing down their X chromosome and the mother is also passing down the X chromosomes. Whereas with a son, the male is also passing down the Y chromosome, so no sons will be affected. If it's a female to a trait, you get 50%, and it's every affected person has at least one parent with the trait. Because if you think about it, your mother or your dad has a dominant X, it will be expressed. And again, since it's dominant, if it disappears, won't reappear. Cool. So patterns of X-linked recessive, all sons of a female with a trait are affected. And that's because if it's recessive, it has two recessive copies, so two lowercase x's. The son will always inherit an X chromosome from the mother. So if you get a son of a female who's affected, they'll always have it. And that's probably the main way you can spot that. Cool. Um, you also need to know this, which is basically that because females have two copies of the X chromosome, you don't get twice the amount of expression in females. Because like in males, you have expression of one X and one Y. One, one, one y. So what happens is one X chromosome gets inactivated, and this can lead to mosaicism of X-linked conditions. So do you guys know what mosaicism is? Yes. Uh, so mosaicism is basically when a, a condition can be expressed in some cells of the body, not all cells in the body. So it's like if you had trisomy 21 in like 50% of the cells in your body. Cool. Uh, you can also have y length, which is super easy because it's all the males have, have it and then no females have it. This one is the, basically the equivalent of Y-linked, which is mitochondrial. Now, mitochondrial DNA can only be inherited from the mother. So if you see a pattern of inheritance that's like coming from the mother and it causes all their sons to be like all the sons, or like all, if the mother has it and all their children have it and then like a son will breed with like another mother that does not, another female that does not have... <laughs> the son will breed with another female who does not have the condition and then the condition will disappear. Okay, that was a uh, stitch up. <laughs> so you get Mendelian inheritance and you also get polygenetic inheritance. So Mendelian inheritance is basically saying you do or you don't have it, which is like non-continuous. Polygenetic is talking more about continuous um, traits. So like things like intelligence or height. So it's basically saying several genes at different loci have an additive effect. Um, yeah, just know the keyword continuous polygenetic. Cool. Heritability, no. Um, so this is a way that I, well, I found a website that kind of allows you to determine how to um, sort of process these steps in determining inheritance. So if you look at this, right, and it says it doesn't skip a generation, then that's probably dominant. Now at this point, it can either be autosomal or sex related. So you can either, you can take a look at if it's autosomal and sex related. If it's affecting males and females kind of equally, it's probably autosomal. If it's affecting females or like a certain gender more, you know it's sex linked, so it's X linked or Y linked. And at this point in this example, we know it's autosomal because it's affecting both parties equally. So we start kind of like, we can start subbing in like values. So if it's guessing if it's dominant, then we can kind of sub in the the capital R into it and see if it works. If it's recessive, we can sub in the recessive traits, the homozygous recessive traits, and see if it works. Now, this isn't, this is kind of a more foolproof method than kind of like taking a guess and like looking at multiple choice. Um, but yeah, if 
if you get a question like this, this is a step that I recommend doing. Cool. So we're going to go over a few questions. Again, just shout out the answer when you have it. Mitochondrial? Yeah, so this one's mitochondrial because, again, all the mothers that have the condition pass it down, and then all the mothers that don't have the condition don't pass it down. Cool. Did someone say autosomal dominant? Yep, autosomal dominant. I just realized I put up the answers in the pre-slides as well, so please don't look at them. <laughs> um, so which kinds of inheritance does this trait follow? Would it be Y-linked? It wouldn't be Y-linked. Can anyone tell me why? Yeah. Exactly. So it wouldn't be Y-linked because it skips this generation. If it was Y-linked, this dude would have it as well. So you know it's recessive because it's skipping generations. Would it be autosomal or X-linked? X-linked, yeah. So X-linked recessive, only males have it and it skips generations. Cool. <coughs> Population genetics. This is my favorite. <laughs> Jokes. Um, genetics and medicine. So. I'm just going to go over like this preamble. You guys had a few genetics lecture about population genetics. So this is just like stuff you need to know. The whole point behind population genetics is you want personalized medicine. So you want to know the genetic makeup of a person so that when you prescribe treatments for them, you can kind of tailor it to their genetic makeup. So for example, if they have a gene that says they can't take a certain medication, this is why you would use personalized medicine and pharmacogenetics. Cool. So this is a potential ethics question that could come up or like a multiple choice short answer question. The advantages of consumer genetics, so preventive treatment, less reactive medicine is more cost effective. Disadvantages, again, if you're sending it off to companies, you get privacy. You also get like a Gaddick situation where you have like insurance fund discrimination based on your genetic makeup. And the genetic, the, the companies like 23andMe that do it are like actually really inaccurate and have like a really broad spectrum. So don't trust those companies. Um, I put a few ethical issues for you to look at below. That's just content you need to remember. Applications of medicine. So again, like we said before, you need, in some instances, you need genomic sequencing to confirm clinical diagnosis. So things like cystic fibrosis or Down syndrome, they use genomics to confirm a diagnosis. Now you can also use genomics to prevent secondary prevention, so screening. So for example, children with Down syndrome, or like fetuses with Down syndrome cystic fibrosis, if you have the screening early, then some people might decide to abort the fetus, stuff like that. You also get treatment, so progress in pharmacogenomics. So for drugs that like, for example, warfarin, you guys wouldn't have learned about yet, but it's basically a blood thinner. Some people respond differently to it and metabolize it differently. So if you know that effect eventually is gonna happen in the individual, you can tailor the drugs you prescribe. So yep, pharmacogenomics. So the example is warfarin. Okay, so that was the bullcrap part of this. Now we get to population genetics, which is the mathematical aspect of genetics. Okay, so calculation one, the gene pool. So the gene pool is just the sum of all alleles in a population. Very simple calculation. So calculation two is the allele frequency. It ranges from zero to one. Again, it's like a percentage zero to one, except it's in decimals. So the general equation is the number of allele copies of an allele, the number of copies of an allele in the population versus the sum of all alleles in the population. So if you have a population N, then P, the frequency of um, the AA, would just be two times the number of heterozygote individuals because they have two of the dominant traits, the uh, dominant genes, and the times one of the homozygous population because they have one copy of the dominant, dominant gene. Whereas with this one, you're times two the homozygous recessive and times one the heterozygous um, population. Do these calculations make sense? Cool. And P plus Q equals one because you can't have 110% expression. Um, so we get to the Hardy-Weinberg law now. And basically the Hardy-Weinberg law is talking about how allele frequencies don't change over time. Keyword, large randomly mating populations, allele frequencies do not change over time. And the equilibrium is basically saying no matter how, like, how genetic, like genotype, no matter how much genotype frequencies change, <laughs> the alleles which exist in the population will remain constant. And this is the Hardy Weinberg equation. So, when it comes to the Hardy Weinberg model, we make a few assumptions. The first being that there's no mutations. 
Second being there's no migrations. Three, large populations for no selections and random mating. So basically this is like the perfect population for like studying genetics. So if you, these can come up in like short answer questions. They'll be like, which factors can disrupt the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? So of course, if you have mutation, there's introduction of new alleles into the population, disrupts it. And there's also mechanisms which alter the existing genetic variation. So if you have migration, for example, of a new population into like a current population, of course, you're going to get a change in genetic makeup. If you have positive and negative selection, so positive selection is advantageous genetic variant sweeps the population, increasing reproductive fitness. Fitness. So, example, if you're in a malaria region, sickle cell disease is actually protected from malaria. So, if you have sickle cell disease, that means it's going to be positive selection because everyone else dies from malaria and you have sickle cell, which sucks, but you don't have malaria. Also, you get this, which I've explained on the slide. It's a bit rough to like explain in person, but I've done like an analogy for you. So, Genetic drift is basically the amplitude of the allele frequency fluctuating from one generation to the next. And I just realized I read that straight off the slide. Um, but, okay. Sorry. yeah, so an example of this might be like the sample of the population, yeah? So if you have a small sample, you would have a sort of like an unequal distribution of alleles. So an example of that, if you like toss the coin twice, you get 100% heads. Whereas if you toss the coin 10,000 times and you got 50%. So the actual, <laughs> so the actual genetic composition has to be determined in a large population. You also get population bottlenecks. So when a population suddenly decreases, like if you get a genocide or something like that. Um, and of course it's the same example as previously. It's too small of a sample to determine genetic variation. You also get non-random mating. So selective mating means that particular phenotypes, which have uh, particular allele dis like descriptions, get promoted more in the population. So we're just gonna do a few questions now. Does anyone have any questions about the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? <coughs> yep, so inbreeding is basically like, you know what inbreeding is basically. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> No, okay. it, you, so it's like breeding within like the same, like it's like if you like, <laughs> it's like the brother and mother thing that I talked about, yeah, like the son and the mother, yeah, that's inbreeding. Because then you have like increased homozygote expression, whereas like if you breed, it's like all the, you know, all like the Russian monarchs and how they just like inbred, then like that caused like, like just like a decreased genetic variation. Eventually they all had hemophilia because like one mother had hemophilia and then that passed it down to the son and then they inbred again and then everyone had hemophilia. And then like the last person died from like not being able to clot blood, which sucks. Um, and outbreeding just basically you increase like the genetic variation by like breeding outwards. No, that's non-random mating still. So like you, if you're going out of your way to breed out, like you, you, it's like a hypothetical population that just like breeds like with whoever. All good? Okay. Do you have an answer? Do you have an answer? Hey, so it's C, D, and E. Hey, so it's C, D, and E. Uh, that's easy. Um, so, um, oh, that's so, okay, so you have to have no mutations, no migrations. It's supposed to be a large population, non-selective, and random mating. Cool. So, on to the final part. Um, yes, yeah, special, special person. Hey, Connor. <laughs> okay, moving on. 
So we're going to go over genetic mutations and chromosomal abnormalities. So this is going to be the last segment of this presentation, which in 15 minutes is pretty doable. So genetic mutations. Yep, so it can either be somatic or gamete or dominant because if it's in gamete cells, it gets passed on to the next generation, which is why it's considered dominant. Whereas if it's in somatic, then it's like it's in you alone and it doesn't get passed down. So phenotypic effect. So there's different types of mutations, right? So you get silent mutations, which basically don't do anything. You have a mutation, but it doesn't have an effect. You get a loss of function mutation, which means that it affects the protein function probably negative and it's generally recessive and you also get a gain of function mutation so protein again with an altered function but it's usually adds a function to the protein you also get a conditional mutation which I'm not going to go over but basically it's what ha it's what happens when you have like exposure to carcinogens or something like that but you have a gene that predisposes you to respond to those carcinogens cool so we get to nucleotide level mutations so these are like point mutations so again, we have silent mutations, which is a change of one nucleotide, but it doesn't change the amino acid. So it's the same protein gets produced. You get missense mutations, which is you get a change of nucleotide, which causes the amino acid to change, and it can either be a gain of function or a loss of function. You also get nonsense mutations, which means that there's a stop codon earlier in the chain of the um, nucleotide, which causes a stop codon to be produced, which means that the protein is in, like, not, not formed correctly. And you also get frame shift mutations, which basically screws every single amino acid that you're producing, so you have a non-functional protein. So an example of a mutation on the genetic level would be sickle cell anemia. You guys don't need to know this, but I just want to show you how this can be an example of this. So what happens in sickle cell is that you get a point missense formation. So you get an amino acid that's formed incorrectly. And what that causes instead is that it causes the red blood cells to lose their cytoskeleton. And that causes clogging up in the capillaries and it causes ischemia and all that stuff, which is loss of blood. So mutations, pros and cons, you get genetic diversity and selective advantage. It can also be harmful. And I don't know what neutral means, but we'll go on. So chromosomal abnormalities. So these are basically abnormalities in the chromosome count or yeah. So you get these three types of chromosomes, the metacentric, submetacentric, and acrocentric. The difference between submetacentric and acrocentric took me a long time to understand, but acrocentric have satellites, whereas with submetacentric you have chromatids. So satellites aren't like they don't actually contain like a lot of chromosome at all. Like basically they're just like non functional units. Cool. So the process by which you can you can identify chromosomes is karyotyping. All you need to know during this is that the keyword is metaphase. The light bands are euchromatin, which is undergoing transcription, and the dark bands are heterochromatin because it's condensed and it's not undergoing transcription. If you think about it, that makes sense because you kind of need to expand the DNA to be transcribed. So you don't need to know this. Um, so the basically, when you'll get exams, questions and exams that tell you to identify a karyotype. So how, you, you, how it gets named is that you have 46 chromosomes, you have 22 autosome pairs and one sex chromosome pair. And it will be the total number of chromosomes, the sex chromosome makeup and the abnormalities observed. So for example, you have 46 XY, it's a normal male. Can anyone tell me what the next one is? Can you can, give me the full description? Yep, so female with trisomy 21, which is Down syndrome. Yep, so this one, so remember you have the P arms, which is like the petite arms, the smaller arms. So a female with a deletion of a short arm on the chromosome P. Apparently you make cat sounds. Um, this is a more specific way of describing the chromosome. So you have the gametes abandoning before, but this is like breaking down the specific locus on the chromosome. Now we have numerical abnormalities. So we have under chromosome abnormalities, we have numerical and structural abnormalities. So the first thing is a different count. So aneuploidies are just like missing or additional chromosomes, and that's caused by non-disjunction, which is basically the non-joining of the chromosomes during anaphase. You guys don't need to know the mechanism, that's just extra stuff. 
Polyploidy is when you have a multiple of a haploid number. So for example, if you have 92 chromosomes. So these are the conditions that you need to know. Patel is trisomy 13, Edwards is trisomy 18, and Downs is trisomy 21. Now, the way I remember it is like, these conditions all occur in children, and like, children somehow gets associated with pedophiles. And pedophiles, it goes P-E-D, which is 13, 18, 21. I've been told I have really crap mnemonics, but like, that just works for me. So Patel, Edwards, and Downs. So those are the autosomal aneuploidies. Um, you also get sex chromosome aneuploidies. So with these ones, it's like Kleinfelters and Turners. These are important because they do come up quite often. And you need to know the symptoms of both. Well, symptoms of Kleinfelters more so. Um, so for Kleinfelters is when you have an extra X chromosome in a male, so you get 47XXY. Um, and you get infertility, like the way you identify it is like gynecomastia, which is like man boobs, um, infertility, they're really tall, small testes and a feminine fat distribution. Um, Turner syndrome is just when you don't have an X chromosome, so it's a female without an X chromosome. Um, and yeah, you get like redundant neck skin and peripheral lymphedema, that's just like swelling. So just know the numbers, 47XXY for Kleinfelters and Turner's 45X. Cool. Now we have structural abnormalities. So these, you have balanced rearrangements and unbalanced rearrangements. So balanced rearrangements are when you have no net loss or gain of chromosome material. So for example, if you have two satellite chromosomes that join together, that'll be a balanced rearrangement. If you have unbalanced rearrangement, that means you have a net loss or gain of chromosomal material, which is usually more severe. You're losing information that's important for your life. So you can have two breaks in one chromosomes as well, which is inversions. So there's no like exchange between chromosomes and you have interstitial deletions, which is like a deletion within the one chromosome. Like this one, that's just the deleted information right there. And in, in inversions, it's like this segment, like these genes here, which just get swapped. Cool. So if you have breaks in more than one chromosome, so yeah, so you get two breaks in one chromosome or you get breaks in more than one chromosome. So an example of this would be a reciprocal translocation. So if you have a cut here on this chromosome, if you have cut here on this chromosome and they just decide to change materials. This is a child which has partial trisomy or monosomy. For example, partial trisomy just means you gain a bit more of one chromosome because it's been cut off and exchanged. A Robertsonian translocation, this comes up quite a lot, so it's important to understand. It's when you lose the two satellite arms and they just fuse together. Now, that, from what I remember, that does cause a trisomy, because you guys have technically the chromosome and then another chromosome with that extra arm. And then you have structural abnormalities, which are insertional translocations. So you get like, two cuts in one chromosome and they just like add it into the other one and you get a deletional abnormality in the chromosome that's been cut. This is very rare. And you also get duplication. So this is just when like within one chromosome, that segment of DNA will just get like duplicated twice. Okay, cool. We're gonna go over some questions. The first question isn't that hard compared to what you think it is. It's, yeah, so E, you guys don't actually need to know any of this because I said frame sheet mutation, so it's just a loss of one amino acid. Yep, does anyone remember the mnemonic? Yep, F, I'm not gonna go over the mnemonic again. Yep, a, um, they're not as fatal as autosomal aneuploidies, so, because they're kind of compatible with life. Like Kleinfels, you can kind of live. <coughs> <coughs> oh. 
Did someone say Turner's? Yep, so Turner's syndrome, metafemales, like when you have three X chromosomes, and I don't know what that does, so. <laughs> um, anyone that said D, you can just leave right now. Um, yeah, so this is Kleinfelters, so small penis, testes, tall, um, you know, Kleinfelters, there you go. Um, and look, I don't know how much time I spent making memes on this, but it's definitely not worth it. Um, but that's all you need to know. Um, if you guys have any questions, please email <laughs> this. Um, it's Hotmail, so it's vintage, so.